Good morning. I'm Janet Lambert. I'm the CEO of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the first cell and gene meeting on the med. I want to thank our partners, our sponsors, and most of all, the team that's worked really hard to put together the program and the event we're about to experience over the next couple of days. Uh, to start out with a little bit of a housekeeping matter, for those of you who are interested in the presentations you're about to see, they'll be available to you in live stream and in recordings and in other formats at themeetingonthemed.com. And other materials that you'll see today will be available to you at the alliancerm.org, Alliance for Regenerative Medicine website. For those of you who don't know much about ARM, ARM is an international advocacy organization dedicated to the promise of bringing safe and effective regenerative medicines to patients around the world. We are a membership organization of slightly more than 330 diverse organizations that include small and large companies, research institutions, patient advocacy groups, and other stakeholders in the success of this sector. We have, since our founding, been focused really on five key priorities. First, to try to, you know, sorry, I think there's a couple of seats if people want to come in. Um, feel free to make your way across. Those priorities are to try to achieve a harmonized and predictable regulatory environment for ATMPs, to enable market access and value-based reimbursement policies for these therapies, to address key manufacturing and industrialization hurdles facing the sector, to focus on the communications needs of this sector, which clearly are robust as we enter into kind of new scientific domains that are not well understood by the public, and in addition, to try to compile the sorts of data that we'll share with you over the course of the next two days about the size and scope of the sector itself. And then, given that the majority of our members are small, enterprise is still in the fundraising stage. ARM works to facilitate sustainable access to capital for our member organizations. ARM started in 2009 and has, a, has um, benefited from significant growth since that time, along with, obviously, the growth of the sector itself. Included in that 330 member organizations are about 20% of those members are European. As you can see here, we have 67 European member organizations, and those members reflect the same diversity as the ARM membership overall. Namely, we are predominantly small companies, we have a significant slice of large companies, and we also have an important and significant portion of not-for-profit and academic institutions. These members' diversity is also reflected in their technology and focus and business type. As you can see, they cover gene therapy, cell therapy, tissue engineering, and various combinations thereof, as well as service providers, CROs, and CMOs. This expanding ATMP sector in Europe, as well as our own growing European membership and activities, led us to launch this meeting on the MED. This meeting is patterned after a meeting ARM has held for uh, nearly a decade called the Meeting on the Mesa in Southern California, which is really the go-to event for the cell and gene therapy community. We wanted to bring that same energy and partnership and programming opportunity to this side of the Atlantic, all for an international audience with a particular focus on the challenges and opportunities in Europe. We're happy to say we have more than 450 people registered for the meeting. Already 500 meetings have been set up in the partnering system, and I'm sure more will happen over the course of the next couple of days. We've been able to attract a number of experts from, from the space, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the various presentations that we've organized for you. Before we kick off the meeting, I'd like to just set the stage a little bit by giving you a picture of the regenerative medicine sector globally and also here in Europe. 
This data comes from a data partnership that we have with Informa in which we track and uh, we, we've developed a, and curate a database specific to the cell, gene, and tissue space. In that database, we're currently tracking 910 companies globally. As you can see, the regenerative medicine sector is highly concentrated in North America, but also with about 25% of the companies that we're tracking located in Europe and Israel. And of course, we're seeing significant growth in the sector all across every region, but particularly in Asia. Looking at the European landscape specifically, we're tracking 233 companies in Europe. UK is the leader with 55 companies. As you can see, Germany and France are also quite strong with 29 each. Israel, 21. Switzerland and the Netherlands, 15. And our host here, Spain, 12 regenerative medicine companies we're tracking at present. We're also um, excited about the changing landscape of available products in Europe and globally. We anticipate that patients in Europe will be able to see several life-changing therapies in the near term. This chart shows what we're expecting to see regulatory approval, regulatory decisions in 2019 and 2020. First, Bluebird's Zentaglow, a gene therapy for transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia, is expecting an EC decision this quarter following a positive CHMP opinion last month. Also, the Netherlands Chiatis Pharma is also expecting a decision this quarter for ATIR 101. ATIR 101 is designed to make partial bone partial match bone marrow transplants safer and more effective for patients with blood cancers. This is significant since approximately 35% of people who are in urgent need of a bone marrow transplant will not find a full match in time. However, 95% can find a partial match. 2019 will also see an EMA decision on the Avexis Novartis Zolgensma. This product received prime designation and has seen remarkable outcomes in its early trials for SMA type 1 patients. As you may know, only about 8% of kids with type 1 SMA make it to their second birthday. But 100% of the 15 children in the early trial of uh, this product have made it past their second birthday with significantly improved functioning. In addition, Orchard is planning on two EMA filings in 2020, OTL 101, a gene therapy for ADA SCID, and OTL 200, a gene therapy for metachromatic leukodystrophy. Behind these products expecting regulatory decisions in the next year or two is a very robust pipeline more than 1,000 gene and cell therapy trials are underway globally, and 324 trials sponsored by European and Israeli developers are underway. Of these, 50 trials are in phase three and 196 in phase two. For those of you who might be interested in the kind of technology breakdown of these trials for phase three, the breakdown is 21 trials in gene therapy, nine trials in gene-modified cell therapy, 15 trials in cell therapy, five trials in tissue engineering. Financing for ATMP companies in Europe and Israel grew significantly year over year, providing the fuel for yet more pipeline development. Total Q1 financing for the sector was nearly half a billion euros, up 143% from the first quarter last year. Of this total, the dominant technologies were gene-based therapies, but note that gene, cell, and tissue numbers do not total to 488 because gene-modified cell therapies are included here in both the gene and the cell subtotals. 
Some of the most significant deals in Q1 2019 that make up these aggregate numbers are in the gene therapy and cell therapy space, Adaptive Bio achieved an upfront 2 billion euro partnership with Genentech and Roche to develop, manufacture, and commercialize novel neoantigen-directed T-cell therapies for the treatment of a broad range of cancers. Vivet Therapeutics raised 565 euros in a partnership with Pfizer, leading ultimately to an acquisition. Vivet is developing gene therapy treatments for inherited liver disorders with high unmet medical need, including Wilson's disease. In cell therapy, PDC line raised $108 million in a partnership with Korean company LG Chem. And Bone Therapeutics raised 24 million euros in a private placement to work on, continued work on their allogenetic cell therapy solutions. In addition to this clinical progress and this financing good news, ARM is also focused on what's the policy environment in Europe and where do we need to continue to focus in order to encourage the growth of this sector writ large. We'll have the chance to address many of these topics over the next couple of days, but just to highlight our sense of what the sector priorities are in Europe. We're very focused on trying to improve market access to promote patient access to AMPs in Europe. Clearly, if we cannot work out a reimbursement mechanism that makes ATMPs both commercially viable and accessible to patients, we won't have accomplished our goals. We aim, in part, to facilitate that, to drive a robust and effective real-world data infrastructure, as we know that these therapies will need, will be, in many cases, approved based on limited data sets for small disease populations, and follow-on data will be important. We are promoting changes to improve the clinical trial process in Europe, where state-by-state -state variation is significant, creating limitations and frustrations, I would say, for those trying to uh, conduct clinical trials in Europe. And finally, we are focused on trying to promote regulatory convergence of requirements for the development and commercialization of ATMPs and have enjoyed a, a productive conversation with both the EMA and the F US FDA on that topic. So with those uh, introductory remarks and stage setting, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Guido Razzi, Director General of the European Medicines Agency.